when it comes to looking at models, it's also important to look at various types of representations. Because we are used to doing things in a certain way. There's something that's called a mechanical age representation. Now, what exactly is that? A mechanical age representation is basically a representation of something in the real world. A piece of paper. Should have brought a piece of paper. So a piece of paper is a mechanical age representation. Now, we have a tendency to take these mechanical age representations and put them in the digital world. Right? You go into Microsoft Office and you have a nice page. Right? Piece of paper. It's a page. Nice page. Right? It works. In that case, doesn't it? It actually does. And this is actually pretty common. We very often do try to take our old representations and put them in new environments. It helps us understand things better. It reduces our cognitive load. Right? We can do what's called scaffolding for ourselves. But sometimes we have these mechanical edge representations and they really should not be translated verbatim into the digital world. Now, I'm going to give you a really silly example. How many of you have ever used a typewriter? Oh, there's still some people. Okay. Oh, good. My summer class, I think there was one person. It was terrible. I'm like, how am I going to explain this? All right. You are sitting at a typewriter, right? I know. You don't see them very often. And you need to type up something on a piece of paper. You're going to type up a letter. How do you put the paper in the typewriter and, and, and move the paper up to the right spot? Yeah, you put it in and you turn, right? What would be a literal interpretation of that in Microsoft Office? Right, so the, equi yeah, the equivalent is you're loading a page, right, and we, you know, use the slider bars or something. The literal one is, now we got a knob, so I'll just stick it over here on my monitor and turn my knob. On some mouses you do have your little scroll bar, that wasn't always the case, and some people don't like it, and sometimes they don't work. But it's... Even, even with that, is it a completely literal interpretation? No, now I can use my finger instead of my whole hand. So we obviously made some improvements in that area, right? It was not a literal translation. That's something that we want to remember. When we're dealing with new technology, we need to see if there are new things that we need to implement. Because there are times where if you just take a literal interpretation, you're going to degrade users' abilities. Sounds really obvious, right? I know, it does. So here's an axiom. Don't replicate mechanical age artifacts and user interfaces without information age enhancements. Let's take a look at another example. A uh, address book. Have any of you seen a physical address book? Okay, yes, good. My grandmother used to have one, right? Couldn't get her to use an electronic one for the life of me. It was, you know, with the little letters and everything. All right, so we are trying to move our address books to the digital age. When you have a physical address book, how do you find someone's phone number? All right, you look for the letter. Most people use the letter of the last name, right? You open it up and find, the, find their phone number. Now, can you do that in, the di in digital products? You can. All right, what about if you forget your, your uh, new friend's last name in an, actual phone, phone, uh, in an actual address book? How do you find them? Page by page by page by page. Do you have to do that in the digital? No. no. There's search. I know, search is so awesome. Right? You just type it in. You can even just type the first letter. Type the second letter. Right? That is a digital enhancement. So in this case, adding to that, 
really makes things a lot more usable. There are times, however, that if we don't think clearly enough about things, we think, again, too literally, and even if we add enhancements, it still artificially constrains what users can do. All right, let's look at a calendar. Let me see, do I have a calendar? Oh, yeah. So let's look at calendars. Typically, when we look at calendars, what do we see? How, how much, what, what is the length of time we tend to see in a calendar? A month. Now, why is that? Yeah, it's how we view it in real life. It tends to fit nicely in, a, in, in one page. Right? You go, we buy our calendar at Barnes & Noble, and we have a nice month. Right? It fits very nicely. Now, original calendars and digital products would just show you a month. That was okay. But then someone realized that people also were carrying around these big, giant, I don't know, portfolios. I don't remember what they're, was it daily planners? Guys, have any of you seen those? Yeah, most of you are like, what's that? Some of you have seen them. They're basically, they're these big, thick books where you would put all your appointments manually day by day. Right, because it was too many to fit into a one-page calendar. So one of the things that ended up being introduced is being able to see calendars by the week, by the day, or even more recently, does anyone know what the more recent? Well, by, well, by hour, but there's another one that's more recent that's really shown up in the past couple of years. By seconds. <laughs> Fortunately, not by seconds. They call it multiple weeks, where instead of just being able to see it month by month, because it used to be January, February, March, April, May. What would happen when you got to the end of the month? Oh yeah, it kind of grays out the, the numbers and you don't see the next following week. So now what they, they've done is that you can say, okay, I want to see at least four weeks so that the week that you're in, that's the one that it starts at. Goes to the next month, you still see it. Sounds really logical, right? How many years did we not have that? A lot. It's really irritating. Now, at the same time, someone may argue, well, OK, do we still need to see things by month? What do you think? Should we keep that in or just get rid of it? Yeah, keep it in. Why? That's what users are used to. You will keep some consistency while still providing enhancement. See how some of the things you er learned earlier kind of fit in? I hope that's a yes. <clears throat> so you want to make sure that when you make changes, they're changes that people are, can easily adapt to. In the case of calendars, we are just adding enhancements. Makes it a lot easier. Now there are times when companies have made significant changes that haven't quite worked out as well. Here's another axiom. Significant change must be significantly better. Who can think of an example where, a recent example, where the significant change was not received very well? Windows 8. I knew I wouldn't even have to prompt you for that. Right, so Microsoft expected Windows 8 to come out, and people would just be falling all over themselves with how wonderful it was. Yeah, not so much. They went and they did major changes that users did not, and many still argue are not, significantly better to make such a drastic change. Now, what do you think would have been a better approach? Right, it would have been better from a user's perspective to keep cons some consistency, and then you just start adding these new capabilities and you move people over more gradually. That's easier for people. But now they have a situation that, although is not as bad as Vista from what I understand, but is a similar pattern where basically people were saying, yeah, no. You know what happened with Vista? Yeah, a lot of companies said, no, we're staying with XP. 
A lot of companies completely skipped over getting Vista. And there are some that are saying, yeah, with the way Windows 8 is now, no, nope. we're waiting. We're sticking to Windows 7, thank you. It's easier, it's cheaper, I don't have to retrain my people. So you do need to be really, really cognizant of how is the user going to see the change, even if you see it as significantly better. Any questions? Should I quiz you on the one thing I really want you to come out of that lecture from? Because I mentioned it like 20 times. The user's mental model should be closest to the represented model. What is the represented model? The designer model is the behavioral face of the product. See, now if I include that question, not saying I will, but I might, I have in the past, you guys will ace it. 